Hello, this is Jason Kendall, and welcome to the next of my introductory astronomy lectures. Last time we were talking about binary stars, how we deal with their masses, spectroscopic binaries, and eclipsing binaries, and we finished off with an amazing discovery around the closest star to the Sun, which is Proxima Centauri, and then it has a star, a planet orbiting around it that was discovered through spectroscopic uh, analysis of the radial velocity of Proxima Centauri. And the planet is dubbed Proxima b. What we've learned is that binary stars are incredibly important tools for the future. But we kind of left off in saying, well, exactly how? Let's make a tiny diversion this time. We're going to look at exactly how we know the mass of this planet, mass of the star. So we wanted to say that how do we know anything about this distant planet that's orbiting a star that's four light years away that we actually can't see? And this is simply an artist rendition of the thing that we're looking at. Artists will make pictures and things like that. And that's the only thing I really don't like about all of these kind of things is that the artist renditions make it look like that somebody's been there or something like that. No, we know that it's only been radial velocity data as we saw in the previous, in the previous episode. So this is a vista that's purely the imagination of an amazing artist. Okay, so how do we know the mass of the, of the planet? How do we know the mass and distance of Proxima b from its star? So we know that this Proxima b is the official name of the planet, and why b? Why not a? Because it's the first planet around discovered around that star. Well, it's because the star itself has an implied a. So the second object in the system has B, so therefore it's called Proxima B. Okay, I know, I know, it's a little odd, but that's just the way it is. So here we go. Let's find out how we know the mass and distance of Proxima B from its star Proxima Centauri. So we start off with the force due to gravity. Newton's law says that the force due to gravity is equal to the mass of the two stars, M1 and 2, or mass of the two objects, M1 and 2, times the Newton's gravitational constant divided by the distance between their centers of masses. And that force is always equal to some mass times some acceleration. So if we can figure out how it's moving, accelerating or decelerating, and get its distance, then we can derive a mass. And that's really what we're going to be hunting for. So remember again, Newton's version of gravity says that you have two masses attracting each other due to the force of gravity. And that force is equal to G, the Newton's gravitational constant, times the, the, the two masses, the product of the two masses, divided by the square of the distance between them. And if we then go through and look at how Newton re-derived Kepler's third law in order not just to say p squared equals a cubed, but specifically if p is in seconds and a is in meters and m is in kilograms, then you can use g, Newton's gravitational constant. Now we can actually measure all of these things in terms of fundamental uh, measurements, such as meters, seconds, and kilograms, rather than years, astronomical units, and AUs, or AUs and uh, solar masses. But this is the equation that can be derived uh, from Newton's laws and Newton's mechanics, and it pretty much falls right out of the equations. It's not that difficult to derive. But that's for another story, and I'll let you investigate that elsewhere. All right. First, let's assume that the planet's mass is much less than the stars, and that's a good assumption in general. So what we have is the, pro the period of the star, meaning how much time does it take for the spectroscopic variability to occur, is equal to the sum of the masses of the star and the planet. And that's, of course, Newton gravitational constant and for pi squared, where pi is that classic number, 3.14159, etc., times the distance between them, r cubed. So r cubed is the distance between the star and the planet. But because the star is so much more massive than the planet, in general, stars are much more massive than planets, then we can simply approximate, that's what that double twiddle means, that, that tilde sort of that bent equal sign means, is that we're going to approximate the sum of the masses by the mass of the star. And that helps us get through some issues. Now, we can then say that the force due to gravity is then the g, which is the Newton's gravitational constant, times the mass of the star, times the mass of the planet, times the distance r squared between them, is equal to, let's just assume, circular orbit. Now, it's orbiting so closely that we, it's probably not a bad assumption to think that the orbit is a circle, because if it's highly eccentric, then that will eventually, that's a higher energy uh, 
that's a higher energy state than if it's purely circular. So the, or the force to maintain something in a circle is equal to the mass of the thing at the end of the circle, or riding the circle, times the speed, v squared, of the planet going around that circle, and r between is then the dis is the radius of the circle. That's why I used r, it's in the d. So again, the subscripts planet mean we're talking about the planet, and r between is the distance between the planet and the star. And we're going to assume that it's orbiting a circle, and we're not worried too much about the reflexive motion of the star due to it, so it's almost as though the star is completely fixed. And that helps us a lot. So let's combine those equations together and shorten things up and, so, and abbreviate planet with PL and abbreviate star with the, with the asterisk. And if we just combine them together, we find that the, velo the speed or velocity around the circle that the planet takes squared is equal to Newton's gravitational constant times the mass of the star divided by the radius of the circle that the planet takes. So that's a fundamental thing. It doesn't matter. We're not approximating anything here. That's just if we're just assuming a circle, the approximation is a circle, and that the planet is going around in a perfect circle. So that's circular speed, and circular speed is pretty much what you get when you say that the mass of the object orbiting is really tiny. So we can assume that it's a circular orbit, and circular speed is pretty good. Another way to think about circular speed is take a string, put like a bolt at the end of the string or some light object that you can spin that's heavier than the string, but not by much, and spin it over your head. It'll be going in a circle because the string is as is, is a fixed length, and it's very light. So therefore, you really don't care. It doesn't pull on your arm that much. And so you can spin something around in a circle that's really light pretty fast. And that would be v sub circle, which is the speed that it's going around in a circle. And that's equal to the square root of the, of the Newton's gravitational constant times the mass of the big thing. In this sense, we could say that my arm is like the star pulling on it. And then r is the radius of the circle. And so all we have to do is measure the Doppler effect, or the speed with which the, uh, the planet is going around. And so it's going to sometimes be going towards you, sometimes going away from you, and sometimes going across your line of sight, and it's going to vary smoothly between them. And that's how we actually get it. Remember that image that we saw from the European Space, space uh, European Southern Observatory, which shows that the dot, shows the radial velocity kind of wags around like a sine curve. And so that's what we should expect. Now we can then add in yet another thing, is that when you think about a center of mass, that they really actually, the planet doesn't really orbit the center of the star, it orbits the center of mass of the star and the planet's system. And so the, the star then orbits the center of mass system. It doesn't, the planet doesn't orbit the center of the star, it orbits the balance point between them. So both of them, the star and the planet, orbit that. But we can then say, well, if they have a distance between them, then the mass of the star times its speed is equal to the mass of the planet times its speed. So if the mass, so the, in this case, two people sitting on the right would represent, say, the star, because they're more massive, and on the left-hand side is the kid, is the boy, and he's less massive. So if they start swinging around on the teeter-totter and like imagine, remove the ground underneath them and go all the way around, then the ones, the two at the center, close to the middle, aren't going to move very fast. But the guy way out there is going to move really fast. And if they're totally in balance, then the mass times the speed at which they're going around equals the mass times the speed of the other one. So the mass of the speed of the one, such as the star, which would be close in, equals the mass of the planet times the speed of the planet, which would be the one far out. So now we have three linked equations where we have the mass of the star, the velocity of the star, the mass of the planet, the velocity of the planet, the orbital period of the star, the distance r between the star and the planet, and the speed at which the planet's going around. And all of these things, we have three linked equations, a mass planet, mass star, v star, v planet. And we have, since they're linked, and we have a few, and a few observables, then we should be able to eliminate and get the, one, the things that we don't know. What can we do with these three equations? Well, first we measure the period of the orbit. And that's simply how long it takes for the sinusoidal uh, orbital period to happen. And in eclipsing binaries or orbits like that that we've seen, that the period is simply how long it takes to go from uh, the or radial, radial velocity of the star going towards you or away from you and back to the original away from you and towards you, how long it takes to vary between towards you and away from you. 
And then the radial speed of the star is how fast it seems to be going around in that orbit. So the radial speed of the star is what you measure, and that is the, is the radial velocity that you get. So that was that fi roughly five or so kilometers per hour on average that it's doing at the most and the least. So that's what we see the radial speed must be. So we assume at the peak of each of the, or the trough, that's the maximum speed, and that gives you the radial speed of the star around its orbit, or around its common center of mass. Somehow, you have to get the mass of the star, and if you combine that all together, you then have three equations and three unknowns. So you measure the star, the, the planets, the orbital period of the, of the spectroscopy. The radial speed is how, how high the peaks and troughs are, and if you can figure out some way to get the mass of the star, then you can get how far the star is, how far the planet is from the star, how fast the planet's going around, and then the mass of the planet. Now, how do you get the mass of the star? Well, we did see that last time, that there's a distinct mass-luminosity relationship between the type of star or mass, or mass spectral type relationship between the mass of the star and its spectral type, assuming their main sequence. What's a main sequence star? We haven't discussed that yet, but we will really soon, so hang on. So the mass of the star can be determined by determining its spectral type. And we'll just leave that be for a moment, and we'll just say we know the mass of the star. And there's other ways to get the mass, but more specifically, we can use such a relationship between the luminosity of the star and the spectral type, as well as extended studies of other kinds of stars and other kinds of close binaries in order to determine the mass luminosity relationship of many types of stars and then average them together to get that. And that's what was done and that was used by the team in order to make their measurement. So it's actually a bit of, a, there's a lot more than just knowing uh, or getting the mass of the star. In fact, there is no absolute mass known of the star. There's no way to actually directly measure the mass of Proxima Centauri. What you have to do is you have to measure the masses of, of known binary stars of exactly the same kind of stars to Proxima, such as these M dwarfs, and then know from that, from their binaries, how, mass, how massive they are from known visual binaries and eclipsing binaries, uh, and, and even maybe spectroscopic binaries, that you can then determine the mass of, of M-type stars. And it takes a large number of them to get, develop the statistics in order to get it. So really, the number three here, somehow know the mass of the star, assumes that you've measured the masses through some other way of all other M stars in the sky. Let's actually look at the first one. If you know the star's mass from the astrophysics, and we'll talk about that later, and we'll get to that, how we know that mass, and that comes from the HR diagram. Whoops, another, another thing that we fell out. Kepler's third law gives you the size of the planet. So we can measure the speed from the spectroscopy. We get the mass, M sub star, V sub planet is, is how fast it's going around, or actually mass sub, mass sub, V sub star is how we get it. But we'll get the planet's orbitary, orbital size. So if we know the mass of the star, we know the speed of the star, we have some sort of handle on the, uh, on the size, we can get the planetary orbital size from it, from these linked equations. And if you know the size of the orbit, you can get the orbital speed of the planet going around. So that's, again, another part of the linked equations. And plugging all this stuff in, using the knowledge of the astrophysics of lots of other observations of other binary, binary dwarf stars, we can tell that a star like Proxima Centauri, like it, and many stars like it, are about 1.23, 0 0.12, 0 0.123 times the mass of the sun, or about uh, one-eighth of the mass of the sun. So it's pretty massive. It's still much more massive than the Earth, but still, that's what we get from, from such studies, and I'll post the link for that elsewhere. And then what we look at is we have the velocity of the star. It's about five kilometers per hour, about 1.3 meters per second, which is a very slow reflex due to the planet. The orbital period is easy because that's the easiest one to measure. It's about 11.2 days. And then Newton's gravitational constant is measured in very hook and crook ways on Earth. But that's a separate thing. That's a, that's a universal constant. Plugging those four numbers into the three equations gives us the mass of the planet, 
being about one and a third time, one and a quarter times the mass of the Earth. So the planet orbiting Proxima, Proxima Centauri, is more massive than the Earth. And the, the speed and its distance from it is about 5% of an astronomical unit, or about six times closer to its star than Mercury is. And that's really, really close. Since that's really close, is we're justified in thinking that a massive star would pull that into a tidally locked orbit so that Proxima b only faces one side of the star. So that's how we do it. And then we can say, what about a physical size? So we get the mass of the planet being one and a quarter times the mass of the Earth. And we assume, dun, 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 that the density is about the same as the Earth, or about 5,515.3 kilo, kilograms per cubic meter. And that's a really reaching assumption, but why not? Let's just start with that. That's a, not a terrible thing because if it's really close to a star, you shouldn't expect an enormous amount of gas to like lower the density. So maybe it's left with pretty much rocky stuff. And so let's assume it's about the same density as the Earth. And that gives us a radius of the planet about just a little bit bigger than the Earth, or about 6,900 kilometers. So it's only about 10% bigger than the Earth. And how we measure density is the mass divided by the volume. And that is the mass sub-Earth, which is mass of the Earth, divided by 4 pi, 4 thirds pi r cubed, which r is the radius of the planet. And so we took the known density of the Earth, we took the planetary measurement, and it gave it the radius of the planet. So really, if we can get the mass, and we have a pretty good idea for why it might be that dense, I mean, it's that close to a star, so it's probably mostly rocky and probably not, uh, not, as, um, not, not going to be as massive as Jupiter because, hey, 1.27 times the mass of the Earth, that's not going to be able to hold on to a lot of heavy gases like hydrogen or helium. So it's not going to be a gas giant. It's going to be a rocky body, and that's why we assume that the density would be about the same as the Earth. So it's a pretty good guess. So from this, we would assume that the, that the radius of the planet is about 10 times bigger than the Earth, which is really something. That's what's really interesting about this whole thing when we talk about binary stars, and I'm just going to swing all the way back up and say, leave us with this particular thing, which is we can look at the nature of stars. And when we check out stars, we can get their masses. And when we get their masses, we learn amazing things about the nature of stars and their masses. And looking at them, we, we determine huge amounts of interesting data about them, not the least of which is that there's a relationship between the masses of stars and their, and their spectral type. And remember, we talked about the nature of spectral type a little while ago in a couple of lectures ago. We have OBAF GKM. And now we have this concept, and we see this in here, about main sequence stars in binary orbits. And there's so now we have to say... What is the relationship that we find that this interesting relationship between the absolute luminosity, M sub V in the visual, and a star spectral type, O, B, A, F, G, K, M, maybe even L. When we look at those kind of stars, we find a fascinating relationship. And that line that we see on this graph is incredibly important to all of astrophysics and it is the basis of which we understand how the galaxy shall evolve, how we actually get stars that evolve, that where all the elements in our body and all of those things come from, is basically starts from this graph, which is the relationship between the brightness of a star and its spectral type for a given kind of star, main sequence. And we'll be talking about that next time. See you soon.